just want to see if you guys can see this. So I want to see if you guys can get a close up of that. This guy is my 1983 G.I. Joe Laser Trooper, codename Flash that I got when I was six years old. This is not my original one. I picked this up on eBay. But my mother gave this to me when I was six years old and it's part of, he's gonna be part or focus point in this whole video. It's pretty cool. He's got, this is not for you geeks out there. That's not his original backpack, did the best I could. But he's got the laser rifle, swivel arms, laser rifle connects to the backpack, visor, to protect himself from the fierce scorching laser, whatever. <laughs> um, loved G.I. Joe when I was a kid and uh, as a psychologist now or in the psych world, I'm not a psychologist, I'm a social worker, but um, if you look at his face, let me see if I get in there. He's got this like he's so cool, he's over it affect. But anyway, this is my flash and he's gonna be the focus of our story today. Um, I wanted to circle back to, oh, now I'm in focus. I wanted to circle back to the last attachment video. And I was thinking that, um, you know, we can name our attachment style. We can get a good ballpark of it. <clears throat> we can name that our parents were narcissistic. We can put a stamp, CPTSD. We can put all these sort of ideas and concepts together, which are helpful. But they sometimes those stamps or labels, they don't tell the how of how we got them. It doesn't exactly tell the why about why that they're there. And I want to tell you a story today to tell you a little bit about my own attachment style and how I got there. And Flash is going to be the sort of the focus of that story. And um, I think that some of these stories, they're, they're not, they are missing in therapy. Meaning that if we might get depressed, you're anxious, you're this, you're that, some meds, let's try this. We don't spend enough time figuring about how somebody got depressed, how somebody got anxious. We don't really investigate enough into their childhood and that's how I feel about things. Not everybody wants that, but that's how I feel about things and that's okay. Um, so in eight, I'll just go get into the story. So in 1983, I was six years old, somewhere around the level of this cuteness. Put a picture up. This is me around the time of starting sort of kindergarten. And um, just one day, I couldn't, can't tell you what time of the year it was, but my mom picked me up early from school in kindergarten to get, I think it was either maybe like a, like a pediatrician appointment or a dentist appointment, or it just might have even been around my birthday and I just wanted time with her. So it was like a half day. And she signed me out and I was so jazzed um, to sort of that we were gonna hang out together. And so was she, which was a huge part of the story too. And we hopped in the family's crappy. We had like a Plymouth Valiant, this gray thing um, with vinyl seats. This car had like the plasticky vinyl seats that would sort of like burn the F out of your legs if you were wearing shorts in the summer. And all these little accessories and stuff like that. Um, you had to really keep hold of them if you got a toy because they would just fall into the, the never ending sort of, you're never going to be seen again between the back seat where the where the seat belt would fall under and sort of hide. <clears throat> That's another thing if you grew, <laughs> we didn't use seat belts because they were just jammed under there, but <clears throat> the parenting was so bad that why use seat belts anyway? If you grew up in the 60s through the 90s or even beyond, it's probably a miracle that you're alive if you had parents like mine about safety and stuff like that. So, so she picked me up and I was super jazzed about her sort of spending time with me. And the best part of her picking me up was that she was in a really good mood. This is really the focus point of this memory that I have is that um, my mother always wasn't in a really good mood or an awake mood or sort of a, you know, like an available engaged mood. So it was rare and it was important. So my school was like maybe like an eighth of the mile, like the grammar school, um, down from the center of our town, sort of the center of our life, and it was all on one street. Think like Main Street, USA, but a little bit like 80s trashy, like trashy New England, if, you're ever, if you've ever been through that. I'm not saying New England's trashy, but hopefully you know what I mean. Um, so the school was at one end of this like Main Street, and about an eighth of a mile, half made down, down the street, was the sort of the, um, the strip of all the shops and the places where our, most of my family's life would sort of focus back then. There was, 
they were all mom and pop places in the 80s. So it's sort of like there was the pizza place that we loved. There was the donut shop. There was the five and dime. Across the street from the five and dime was the convenience store. <coughs> the convenience store <laughs> where the adults would have us go run and get scratch tickets and cigarettes for them. Um, there was tchotchke stores where my, it was like a, like a little jewelry store that um, would sell these little like Smurf figurines that were really popular. They'd be like Cabbage Patch Kids, that era of the 80s Smurfs. Um, and we were just all about that store. And there was even this little hole in the wall hodgepodge place where you, it was like a joke shop, kind of like costume shop. I, don't know what was, I can't even tell you what they were. I don't even, maybe they didn't know what they were selling. Um, but I got this really cool white Michael Jackson glove which had sparkles on it. And it was cheap as F, but man, I was like, I was the in my neighborhood that day when I got that glove. It was like sort of ripe, it was like around 83, 84, beat it error, thriller error, Michael Jackson. So, so just trying to paint a picture of what all that was like. But most importantly, in this block strip of Main Street, there was the pub. It's one of the bars that, would, that my siblings and I would spend most of our childhoods in because our lives focused around my parents drinking and therefore being in a bar. And the pub was where the adults would sort of have us run across the street to get the cigarettes or the scratch tickets. I was kind of a, a runner in those early grammar school days. If I was bored, they would send me there or whatever and just would run across the street and go get them with the money that they gave me, you know, like sort of like just contributing to their addiction. Um, and my mother and father would spend hours in this place, depending on the, on, the, on the time of the week. Chances are we were in a bar every day for at least one or two hours. On the weekends, between three and five hours. My siblings and I, we were all in early grammar school. <clears throat> and if it was the summer coming out of this place, it was so dark and smoky in there when you would come out of this place and hit sort of like, we were kids. It's almost like I'm telling like an alcoholic story myself, but we were kids. But when we would come out of this bar, so dark on the inside, it's so sunny and bright on the outside, it was like it would hurt our eyes. So that's to tell you how much time we spent out of there. If you've ever like left a movie theater and you're just like, oh my God, what's that thing in the sky? That's what it was like. And my mother let other alcoholic adult, adults interact with us. You know, scratch ticket smokes, being the runner. I was kind of the mascot of this place at times. And I thought it was totally normal. And none of the, alt, the other adults ever questioned it. I never remembered sort of saying, what are these kids doing in here? Um, or questioned if why we were, why there were kids waiting in a car in the, in the parking lot for hours because we were, we were tired of being in the bar and we would wait there waiting for our mother to come out. So it was a complete failure of healthy parenting and boundaries and, you know, thank God for therapy, here I am, here we are. And we, you know, at times we would be sent to the pizza shop at the, that was like the last stop in the corner of this main street. We would, we would go get a pizza and then we'd bring it back and have the pizza in this bar, in this smoky bar. Skip dinner, just let's get a pizza. So, incidentally, there was also a church around the corner from this bar, which I find weird because it's like my family led this sort of bizarre double life. They were trying to sort of be the church people or whatever and go to church every Sunday. At least my dad was. But then we would have that alternative sort of, my, that was my parents' lifestyle was hanging out in a bar. So, so back to the memory. So my mom was in a great mood this day, and she was really put together. She was really excited to see me. So was I. And she could give me that energy, was feeling good. She picked me up from the grammar school at the end of the street. We drove up, and the first stop was the donut shop. And this donut shop wasn't a Dunkin' Donuts. It was this old school mom and pop place where the counter kind of like was low and you would sort of sit at these individual stools that had like a colory vinyl on them. And they would, you would just ask for the donut that you wanted or the coffee or whatever, or they would bring it to you. And I remember having an English muffin and this, this is very specific memory that I have. English muffin with butter and I loved it. You know, I might not have had breakfast that day, but that's what I sort of had. My mother probably got tea. And my, I would just remember it was like a good sort of feeling because my mother had this gift of gab and she was extroverted. She could sort of talk to the ladies who worked at this donut shop. We were the only ones in there. And I was cute. So it was like sort of just talking about me and I just sort of drank up the attention because it was sort of at that time in my life, or in my whole childhood, we were all on a deficit of attention. So, so I remember that. And then once we were done with the donut shop getting the English muffin is a few doors down past the hardware store past the little like walkway park, past the fish market where my dad would get swordfish and sort of stuffed clams when there was all these little places, was this bar. 
And if there's one thing I'm 100% clear on in my childhood was that it was always on our mind as kids about whether we had to go to the bar or not. We would probably beg and plead not to go, but we knew we would always end there. So me walking past with my mom, is it was, it was probably on my mind. Yeah. And as my mother and I were walking past these places, we walked past the bar, is we skipped it. And we went right into the, the five and dime was next to the bar. And that's where Flash comes in. So at the five and dime, which I love five and dimes, by the way, you know, they're such, they're like a weird catch all of everything from like nail clippers to like office supplies, cascade, groceries, toys. You don't get that weirdness. You don't get that oddness vibe from something like a Target. So every time that I, um, every time I see a five and dime, if it's still in existence, I love going and I love vintage stuff. So I'm all about the five and dime. And I'm also probably dating myself here. So, um, so that's where I got Flash. But after I got the toy, we probably just went and did whatever. But I just remember specifically skipping the bar. It might have been too early in the day. Might have not even been open yet. But I just remember at that time being so focused on if we were going to have to go or not. You know, memories are funny. And at the time of the story, I already had the experience of abuse that having a father with narcissistic personality disorder, an alcoholic mother with borderline features, um, sometimes when the parent is so is that alcoholic. Alcoholism is a lot like an active personality disorder, so it's hard. You don't really know which one it actually sort of is until the person would have some long-term sobriety and if they have the capacity, capacity to work on themselves. But that's what my mom was like. There was already domestic, abuse, uh, um, domestic violence in my life at the age of six, neglect, chaos. And right around the time of this memory that I'm sharing with you guys, we would lose a family member and the family would continue to sort of decline and deteriorate into sort of just sort of chaos and sort of neglect and things were bad and they just kept deteriorating. So what does all that have to do with attachment? By total miracle, when I, was, when I got to therapy later in life at 19, and I was still fresh from the fire about all this stuff, and I started talking to a childhood therapist, you know, I would go to this therapist and I would talk about how amazing a person my mother was. And because of these little memories, like the one I told you, it was helpful for us to process those memories because my, my therapist was very wise and she would catch my con she was a, specifically a childhood trauma specialist so she was sort of just she was on this stuff and she would catch all my contradictions meaning that she um, the contradictions that, that people have when they're new to looking at their family system when they're new to this stuff and I would say my mother was amazing uh, but we but she would catch that we spent most of our lives in bars I would say that my mother was a drinker, but I would also say that it was because how bad my father was, and the therapist would catch that, you know, about sort of license, my mother taking license and excuses. Um, I talked about how we didn't have money, and my therapist would counter but that you got, but my mom could afford alcohol. Um, I would say that she was a great mom because I got, but only because I got sort of toys. I would say she was a great mom, but in actuality, the therapist pointed out that she was a mom who was coping and taught me to cope. And I would also say that my mom really loved me, because that's what she verbally said. But the therapist would counter and say, but her, her love didn't match her behavior, which was really a mind-blowing thing for me at the time. Another way that you can look at it is that when I got to therapy, this really good memory was evidence about how malnourished for consistent connection with my mother that I actually sort of was. And what I mean by that is when you, when, when you look at your own childhood and think back to what you needed and what, what every kid needs and what you didn't get, is I didn't need a whole lot of toys. I needed more connection with my mother. I needed consistency. I needed to be home working on things like homework and family life rather than being in a bar. So that's what I mean about, about that malnourished for that kind of stability and connection. So when I started to unpack what happened to us and really sat with what children need, for healthy development, it became more and more clear with the more therapy that I did is that the clarity was I chased my mother because she was inconsistent. And that inconsistency led to how I chose partners later in life in my late teens and early 20s how available they were or how unavailable they were or how more how 
available I wanted them to be, I chased. So when a child's parents are addicted, coping, self-consumed, but can once in a while be in a good mood, you chase that connection of the good mood. You chase that experience as kids. And as part of the chase, it's like being hypervigilant about their bad moods. What's going on for them? Um, what you do and what you don't do might contribute to, to those moods. That's how children think. Sort of like, mom's in a bad mood because I asked for milk money earlier today. Children think they cause these things, and that is actually a survival mechanism. Um, and we also, we keep really focusing on the potential of a good connection, the potential of a good mood, or at least that's how it happened to me. So in my 20s, while I was in therapy, my dating attachment style was anxious, preoccupied, chasing. As a six-year-old, my attachment style was anxious, preoccupied, chasing, being aware, um, being so wrapped up in whether it was going to be a good day or a bad day. And as a kid, I checked up on my mother constantly. I was her caretaker, her emotional well-being came first to me, and I would also do that in my relationships later too. I was sort of the selfless sort of person. I don't mean like I was overly giving. There was just no concept of me. It was just all about the other person and if they were going to leave or not. Um, so that's how my attachment style took root. And it would later change to other styles, but that's what it was like for me in those years. Thank God for therapy. So with that story that I just told you, again, it may be easier to see an attachment style develop from someone's childhood when it's not your childhood. But I have some suggestions for you guys or some homework. Get a, go to the last video and get a ballpark idea of your attachment style. The second thing what you do is you sort of write out some ideas or a story, just like as I just recounted to you, some vague memories, some, some ideas about your family system. Think about it in terms of like this, guys, is to think about when you were six years old, who was your person? Who was the person that, whether it was a bad attachment or not, who was the person that you were attached to? What was going on for them? meaning what kind of mental state were they in. My, I just happened to have an unavailable alcoholic mom with borderline features. And when you put that in terms of what that would have been like for a six-year-old to have a parent like that, you can see this stuff sort of unfold. So at that time, what comes to mind? What comes to mind? Did you, do you remember waiting to connect with your parents? Do you remember avoiding parents? Do you remember um, your parents being so wrapped up in somebody else that you got forgotten. All of that stuff to try to come up with chunks of that story. Um, and to put yourself in a kid's shoes, again, it's sort of easier to do that for to see somebody else, but it's harder to do for yourself. Um, and if it speaks to you, you know, jump on eBay, jump on sort of Etsy or whatever, and get a childhood toy because it's sort of like the red telephone, I call it, sort of, of making a connection, a tactile connection with your inner child. So that's it. I hope the story resonated in some ways. I hope the video is helpful. And as always, I leave you with, may you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be peaceful and at ease. May you be joyous. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.